Hello, my name is Tim Shoebridge and welcome to this video which is the next in my little mini-series about the Waldorf Quantum. In this video I'm going to be looking at what I consider might be the Quantum's Achilles heel and that is its screen. So am I being a little bit dramatic by referring to the screen as the Achilles heel of the synthesizer? I don't think I am, because at the end of the day, if you think about it, if you think about how much you interact with a synthesizer, if you think about how many countless hours you're sitting in front of it or standing in front of it, it's really important that the way that you interact with that synthesizer works for you, that it's efficient, uh, that it's not frustrating. And if I look at social media and I look at people's comments about the quantum, people who actually own it or have used it, uh, the one sort of single theme that I get or the one single complaint that I really get about it is about the screen. There are some people that even think that their quantums are malfunctioning, uh, they have a hardware fault and they want to send it back. So this video is going to be all about the screen. I am going to be a little bit critical about it, but I'm going to be as honest as I possibly can. Um, I'm going to be comparing it to some other screens on other synthesizers that I do own. Um, and at the end of this video, I'm going to be coming up with some conclusions. Um, I'm going to come up with some suggestions for you as to how you can get the best out of the screen on the Quantum. And I've also got some suggestions for Waldorf as to how they might be able to improve the whole experience. So I really do hope this video is uh, in useful to you, enjoyable. Thanks very, very much for watching. Right, so I think the first thing to do um, is to actually give you a little tour of the screen uh, to show you what kind of things you need to use the screen um, to do. Um, and I'm also going to be picking on things that I find frustrating and I know that other people find frustrating as well. So this is going to be quite a critical part of the video. Critical as in critical of the screen itself. So here we have a typical screen. It looks lovely, right? And there's an awful lot of parameters in here uh, that you can change. You've got these parameters down the left and the right of which you have rotary encoders to be able to change those values. So we don't actually have to touch the screen to change these values at all. Same with uh, the left hand side. Um, but we have a whole bunch of other things. Uh, we've got down the bottom one, two, three, four, five parameters, FX type, uh, something called stepped, limit, mode, and travel mode. Uh, these are things that there aren't encoders for. We need to touch the screen in order to set the value. So here's ping pong, or this is travel mode. It's set to ping pong. I can set it to cycle by actually touching these little pop-up menus that you get. Um, you've also got here tools, which is another little pop-up menu, presets that takes you to a whole new sort of new little dialogue screen which you have to close. Um, and then you've got tabs at the top here as well. So there's a lot where you need to be touching and selecting things on the screen and that's fair enough. But you can also drag. Uh, it depends on what value, uh, sorry, what's, what screen you're looking at. But here with a wavetable, if I hold down and I move my finger up and down, I can drag that red line. I can drag the position uh, of the waveform that we're currently playing within that wavetable. Now I don't have to drag up and down uh, to do this. You'll see that there's a value moving over here, this parameter. So this red line, this position is also controllable by uh, this rotary encoder here. And on this particular screen, I can also use the big black rotary encoder at the bottom. The big black rotary encoder, uh, I have to say, its, its role from screen to screen is a confusion to me. I don't get it. Here, it is changing position. On other screens, if I go to Control Tab here and I move it, it's changing semitone, top left. A lot of the time, this rotary encoder is changing the top left value. But on this particular screen for wavetable, it's changing position. But what I'm trying to say is, 
that you don't have to drag your finger up and down the screen in order to be able to change this value. Now, the drag operation on the screen is the most frustrating of operations. Tapping is one thing, but dragging is another. And the reason why dragging is a uh, frustration is because you need to be maintaining contact, electrical contact with the screen constantly while you're dragging, otherwise the drag will stop. And I'll show you in a second, uh, probably the most, most frustrating screen of all, for me at least, when it comes to this drag. But before we get there, I want to just touch on if you'll excuse the pun, I want to just touch on one issue that people have been talking about on the internet, and that is a lack of sensitivity on the screen on the right hand side. Now I figured out what it is um, that they're doing or trying to do um, that is giving uh, this issue for them. Now you'll notice uh, this sort of these six parameters that we've got on the left and the right. Uh, you'll notice that as well as a name, position, wavetable, phase, we've got the value. We're showing what the current value is that's selected. And there are one or two little words in boxes beneath it. This one's got the word mod. This one's got normal and mod. This one's just got normal. Now, what mod means is, if a mod appears, it means it's a modulatable parameter which means we can actually set a modulation against that parameter. We can do it in a completely different screen, which is the mod matrix screen, or we can just tap here and choose modulations from the list, and we can set our modulation now using the controls on the front panel of the synth. So anywhere where there is a mod, you're going to want to probably tap on it at some point, choose modulations, either to see how it's being modulated or to set a modulation. What does normal mean? Well, normal is the sort of the calibration of the movement of this rotary control. You'll see here one, two flicks of the control, and I've gone from the minimum value all the way to the maximum value. Uh, each tick or click is five degrees, as you'll see it going up. But we can change that. And if I tap on here, I've got normal, fine, and super fine. Um, and these are ways of increasing the control, the level of control. With super fine, you'll see that now normal changes to super. And each click is half a degree. Really, really super fine as the name implies. Now, whether you've got normal or you've got normal and mod or just mod, uh, my initial impression is, or my initial uh, assumption, should I say, is like on a smartphone or a tablet, uh, I need to be touching on mod or touching on normal. But actually, it doesn't matter where you touch in this box, anywhere in this box that's now turned sort of blue color, you'll get the same menu up. Um, if I touch over here, I get the same menu up as if I touch over here. It makes no difference. I get to choose modulations and I get to choose normal, fine and super fine. So it doesn't matter where I touch. Now where I think people have an issue with the screen is that actually sort of like the first f five or ten millimeters uh, down this right hand side, uh, it doesn't respond to your touch which means if you're trying to touch that mod box, it's not going to do anything. But you don't need to touch on that mod box. You just actually need to, as I managed to do then, you just have to touch in the big box here, anywhere in here, to get that menu up. You don't have to touch on mod. It's not important that the screen is not responding to touch down this very far right-hand side. So it's not a fault with your screen. It's not a hardware fault. It's just, it's just the way it works. Yeah, as in, it doesn't work touching down this far right-hand side. But then there's no reason for you to touch down this far right-hand side. Once you realize this, uh, you just know that there's no problem. You just tap a little bit further in from the right-hand side. 
Okay, so now let's go to the most annoying screen that I mentioned before. That annoying screen for me is the save screen. Now the save screen is where you save your preset, all of the values you've been playing around with and tweaking, and you can also specify a name, give it a bank, set the author, and set some attributes. So the attributes are searchable attributes. The synth comes with a bunch of attributes already, but you can create your own. And you create your own by touching here um, where you see the little plus sign. If I touch there on that plus sign, I then get um, a keyboard up and I can add in my own attribute. To get out of that, I have to press cancel. Um, but if I want to choose uh, an attribute that I've already got or look at the attributes I've already got, I touch here and then I get a list. Now, as you'll see, there is a sort of scroll bar here on the right hand side indicating that actually there's an awful lot more values available than what you can see in this list right now. And I'm going to need to scroll up and down it. And I need to scroll up and down it using my finger. Um, if I change values with the rotary encoder down the bottom here, it's not moving my selection, it's changing something completely different. It happens to be changing the preset um, number that I'm currently accessing. So the only way I have got to select values in this attribute list is to use my finger and to scroll. Uh, and this is the most frustrating thing because scrolling, boom, like that, right? If electrical contact is broken as you're scrolling, uh, it thinks that you're done, the screen gets removed, and your touch ends up going below to the plus sign, and now I'm entering a new attribute. Even though I don't want to add, add a new attribute, I'm just scrolling through the list, suddenly I've got this, I've got to press cancel to get out, and now I've got to go back into it again, and try it up, oh, and it's done it again. Right? This is where uh, people go, my god, the screen is broken. It's not broken but your electrical contact with the screen on your finger is not working properly. And that is the most frustrating screen of all because there's no other way of doing what I need to do other than interacting with the screen. So you have to have slow movements and you have to have a greasy finger. Now actually uh, for this demonstration I have purposefully made it not work very well. First of all, I've dried my finger. Uh, I rubbed it on my trousers um, to make it uh, less greasy. And the other thing I did was, while the camera was switched off, so I took a little microfiber cloth and I cleaned all of my fingerprints off the screen. That makes everything so much worse because uh, by removing your fingerprints, you're removing the natural oils that are there to help your finger move around. So you need to make your finger greasy and not clean your screen. And then you'll find that this is easier. Slow movements is what you need. Very frustrating, that particular screen, because there's no other way of changing values, basically. And I'll come to another screen uh, where uh, I have similar frustrations. Um, so here we're back at the oscillator screen. If we go to the control tab, here we've got a couple of values down the bottom here. Um, so they don't have their own rotary encoders. Uh, we have to change the values using the screen. So pitch var, it's a, it's a variable that, uh, a parameter rather that I mentioned in my last video. Um, you get this lovely little sort of like um, control come up you can tap away at the negative or the positive at top and bottom to move the value if you want to. But if you really want to move values quickly, you need to grab it and slide it up and down. Wouldn't it be nice if once I've got this control selected, this parameter selected, wouldn't it be nice to be able to go to this rotary encoder here and actually just change it? But no, this rotary encoder is changing the value at the top left here, semitones. It's not changing the one I have selected. It would be so, so useful if all I had to do 
or select something and then use the rotary encoder to change the value. It really would be so useful. But this again is one where I'm going to have to drag up and down. Okay, so that's a quick demo of the quantum screen and sort of touching on a few of the frustrations with it or a few of the difficulties with it. Um, but is this a bleeding edge technology? Is this the best that we can expect from touchscreens in synthesizers? Well, actually, no. This technology has been around for a very long time. Um, I was just thinking before putting together this video, what's the oldest piece of equipment that I've got that's got a touchscreen on it? Um, and that is a, a Roland V synth, and that's going back to 2003, uh, 16 years ago. So a very long time ago. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that V synth next, show you how it works. It is dated technology. Uh, you're going to see that from the screen itself. Um, and I'm also going to show you two other pieces of equipment that I've got that have touchscreens. Really just to compare them against the Quantum so that you can see how other manufacturers have implemented uh, their screens in their products. So that's what's coming up next. Okay, so this is my old Roland V-Synth um, and this is the screen. It's got some strange uh, color hue to it, I have to say. Uh, I don't quite know what's going on, but I think that's just part of its age. Um, I'm hoping you can see it okay with the camera setup I've got here. Now, uh, you can see immediately that it's a, it's a lot lower definition in terms of the graphics uh, than the Quantum. So you can see, you know, it, you can see its age in terms of the graphics. Uh, but actually in terms of touching, well, we've got lots of selections going on in the screen. You hear it beeping rather annoyingly every time I, I select something. Um, we've got little tabs. Where we've got values uh, that we need to change, like here on this filter page, I can select uh, a value and then I've got the rotary encoder here up on the right hand side that I can use to change values. I think I might be able to drag as well. Maybe, yes, drag up and down. Up and down movement will change values as well. So we have got the capability of dragging. And if you look here at this envelope, uh, here's another one here. Um, we've got the different parameters of the envelope, which we can then change, or I could drag up and down to change the envelope. But actually, I can also, with this sort of rather crude representation of the envelope here, I can touch it and I can move it around. And dragging seems to sort of, seems to work. It's fiddly but I can drag in there as well. Now, the technology of this screen is old technology. It's called resistive uh, rather than capacitive, which is what the quantum screen is and all modern smartphones and tablets. Um, and the way that this works is it doesn't rely on the electrical conductivity of your fingers. Uh, it just purely relies on pressure. Uh, it's pressure, downward pressure, that's basically bringing two sort of like separate layers underneath the screen into contact. Um, so I can use a stylus, I can use anything. Um, I'm using here just a pencil or the rubber end of the pencil. I don't want to damage my screen. Uh, but I can go around and I can touch very easily with anything. It doesn't have to be my finger anything will work. And that is not the case with capacitive screens. Uh, you need to have a, a stylus that actually conducts electricity. But yeah, this screen works quite well. Okay, so the next synth I want to show you uh, is this one here. It's the Korg Kronos. Um, it's a couple of years old, but it is very, very recent technology, I have to say. You can see that from the screen. Actually, the screen is huge. Uh, it's, it's huge compared to the V-Synth, and it's actually quite huge compared to the Quantum as well. It's a bigger screen. Uh, it's more square in nature, so it, there's a lot more going on. Um, 
It's a touch screen, as you'd expect. Uh, high res graphics on it. So let's go into a uh, preset and see the kind of things that we've got here. We've got these tabbed views, uh, lots of controls on them. Uh, here we've got sliders. Uh, we can drag up and down to change values. But with the Kronos, any parameter that you want to change, uh, if you can drag it, then drag it. But you've also got this rotary encoder here on the right, which will change the value. You've also got a slider here over on the left-hand side as well. So you've got multiple ways of changing the value, not having to rely on dragging on the screen. Um, let's look for some more complex screens. Uh, oh yeah, combi. Wow, look at that. I mean, this is one of the sort of um, the things I'd say against the Kronos is there's just so much on the screen and the writing ends up being so, so small. Uh, it's quite cramped. But here again, we've got sliders or faders, uh, which we can drag up and down. Uh, but we've got other ways of changing them. And we've got these controls here um, for panning. Again, we can drag up and down to change them. But again, we can use controls. So although it's a cramped uh, display, um, the fact that you've got these other ways of interacting with it really, really help. Now, although this is a brand new technology, well, although this is a brand new synthesizer, uh, still uh, actively being sold today, uh, the technology uh, behind this screen is resistive technology, uh, which is quite surprising. Um, so I can use any stylus I like. Here's my old trusty pen with the rubber on the end, the eraser on the end, and I can go around, I can touch uh, quite happily. Um, I can pop up little menus, select from menus. Oh, that's, that's one thing I need to say is that once you've got a menu up, then your rotary encoder allows you to choose from that menu, which is really, really helpful. So yeah, it's a resistive technology, uh, which you could consider is old technology, um, but that means that I can use any uh, anything I like to actually touch on the screen um, and be as precise as I need to be. Right, so this is the last screen that I want to show you. Um, it's not a synthesizer. Uh, it's an MPC Live by Akai Professional. Um, it's got a touch screen on it here. It's a similar dimensions screen to on the Quantum. It's what's called a multi-capacitive screen. Uh, very, very high resolution in terms of its a sensitivity to touch. So I would say probably it's the closest to using a smartphone or a tablet um, in terms of the technology. So yeah, we can go around and we can just tap and we can touch on stuff. No problem at all. Anything that we touch on, uh, we've got this rotary encoder here for changing values, as you can see. Uh, but we can do some fairly cool things. Uh, let's go to uh, sample edit. Okay, so here is a sample and we can do similar sort of um, gestures that you can do on a smartphone. We can pinch to zoom out and reverse to zoom in. We can uh, swipe really quite easily um, to move around. As you can see here, we can go in um, and we can set start and end points. Uh, when I get on to do a video of the particle engine on the quantum, I'm going to come back to this screen because this is just so wonderful for being able to edit samples, set start and end points for loops, etc. Um, and it, it is something that I really wish the quantum could do, and it can't. But anyway, as you can see, the screen is is very very responsive. Um, to drag movements, uh, to pinches and stuff like that. Um, it's a real joy to use. This for me is sort of like the best touch screen on any instrument I've ever used. It's fantastic. 
Right, well, as I mentioned with the resistive screens, the Kronos screen and the V-Synth screen, uh, you can use any kind of stylus to help you. Uh, as long as it's hard and pointy enough, you can touch uh, on those screens. Now, a capacitive screen can also use a stylus, but it has to be a special kind of stylus, a stylus that conducts electricity. So I can't, for example, use my trusty old pencil here and the rubber bit on the end. Uh, this doesn't conduct electricity, so I can't use it. Just the same as I can't use it on my smartphone or a tablet. I can't use it on the quantum. Um, so you need a special kind of stylus. Now, there are plenty of styluses out there that you can buy, but they're all designed to work on a smartphone or a tablet. Uh, they're all quite small. And what I found, having bought many of them to try on my Quantum, is that they don't work because their surface area is too small. Uh, you need a big enough surface area to conduct enough electricity for the Quantum screen to work because it's not very sensitive, and this is the issue with this screen. So a small uh, uh, stylus won't work. I even bought this. Uh, it's a, it's like a, a crayon. Uh, it's actually a stylus for capacitive screens. It's to sort of mimic uh, a whiteboard marker or a crayon for a kid. Uh, it works on capacitive screens. But even being as big and fat as it is, actually the tip of it is not big enough in terms of its surface area to work with the quantum. It won't work. The only way I can get it to work is to lie it on its side so that it takes a lot of surface area up and then it, of course it's useless to me. So even something like this uh, won't work on the quantum screen. Trust me, I couldn't find a stylus that would work. So then I decided to try and make my own. Uh, I actually got a six inch nail, I smoothed and polished the head of the nail with a big round head on it and I found that that was just big enough to be able to touch on the quantum screen but clearly I don't want to use something that's hard uh, and metal because I'm going to destroy uh, a very expensive synthesizer. Uh, I ended up coming round to, um, you can buy gloves for the winter. Uh, Maybe if you've got kids and they've got phones, you'll, you'll find that you can buy these little gloves. They've got little tips to them which are actually able to work with a smartphone. So you don't have to take your gloves off to actually use your phone. And they are using a sort of like knitted material that conducts electricity and it works. And what I found online was, it comes from China, it's, it's a little sort of condom shaped thing it's made out of the same knitted material as those winter gloves that work with with phones is um, and the idea is let's get it out so to speak uh, the idea is with this thing is it's it's a little tiny finger <laughs> be careful what I say uh, you can put it on a pen or a pencil <laughs> Um, and as I said, it's made out of uh, material that's stretchy, like, like woolen material, but it conducts electricity. And you can use this on your phone. So you can turn any implement into a stylus. Now, if I did this with a quantum, it won't work. Why? Because the surface area is too small. But if I find a big enough object, like a six inch nail, and I slip it on, <laughs> Uh, then it will be big enough for me to be able to use. So I've been able to create my own stylus for the Quantum by taking a six inch nail with a big round head on it, smoothing it nicely, then taking this strange stretchy material condomy thing, sticking it over the top and then it will work. But it's useless, and the reason why it's useless is because it ends up being just as fat as your finger. So what's the point in going around and touching with a big fat thing? You might as well go around and touch with your finger. So styluses, they just don't work with a quantum at all. Um, I haven't found one, and I think that if you were to find one that works, it would be too big and too fat, and it would just be useless. <laughs> Okay, so how can we get the best experience possible with the quantum screen? Because it is what it is. It's not very sensitive, 
Um, and, and no amount of firmware updates is actually going to make that screen more sensitive. So my first advice, or my main advice, is you're going to need naturally oily, greasy fingers in order to have a good experience with the screen. It's as simple as that. You can say that the screen on the Quantum is ageist, because at the end of the day, the younger you are, the more naturally oily your skin will be, the better experience you'll have with the screen. As you get older, like me, your skin dries out, um, and that's when you'll have frustrating times using the screen. It's also to do with where you live, it's to do with the weather, the humidity, it's to do with how often you wash your hands, uh, it's about what products you use to keep your skin nice and supple and young. All of those things you need to consider when it comes to using this screen because you need naturally oily, greasy fingers. The other thing I'll say is that, you know, when I got this synthesizer, I mean, like all my equipment, I love my equipment. I love keeping uh, my equipment in good condition and I was always wiping uh, the surface of the screen uh, of the Quantum to keep my fingerprints off of it. Uh, I certainly did that more than the normal because I knew that I was going to be doing some videos about the synthesizer and I was going to be doing some close-ups of the screen so I'd get out my little microfiber cloth and I'd be scrupulously cleaning it before I did videos. That is the wrong thing to do because by wiping away those fingerprints, you're wiping away your natural grease and oil. If the grease and oil is on the screen, then it's there to help you maintain electrical contact while you're using it. So my advice to you is keep your screen dirty. Don't wipe off the fingerprints. It's as simple as that. What else can you do? Uh, other things that I found uh, make my use of the screen more frustrating is trying to use it at arm's length. Uh, really, you know, you need to concentrate, you need to be over the top of it, you need to be precise with your movements. Yeah, you need to be using slow and deliberate movements. Uh, it's not a smartphone, it's not a tablet. You can't just swipe it quickly and expect it to work. You've got to put your finger down, you've got to make sure there's enough contact, and you've got to move slowly and deliberately. You know, it's the touching around the screen, selecting stuff, that's fine. It's actually those, those, those movements where you have to drag your, screen, your finger across the screen to sort of change your value. It's those movements that are the most frustrating of all. And that's when I turn to Waldorf. Um, I'd like to suggest to them, before you come out with the next wonderful uh, oscillator algorithm, think about what you can do to make this screen uh, a more pleasurable experience. I think that Korg really got it right with their Kronos. Interacting with the screen is about selecting something. And then once you've selected it, there are multiple ways that you can change a value. Yes, you can drag to change a value, but you can also use a rotary encoder and you can also use a slider. There's always a way of changing values uh, that mean that you're not actually dragging your finger across the surface of that screen, you're just using it to select and touch. And I think it would be really, really straightforward to actually review the user interface of the screen on the Quantum and do a firmware update that allowed that kind of interaction with it. Allow us to actually just use it to select and then make use of that rotary encoder underneath the screen so that we can always change values with that rotary encoder. I really find that there's plenty of times using that screen when that rotary encoder does nothing or it just happens to do whatever rotary encoder number one on the top left does. So I really think that there are things that can be done to improve the interaction with that screen so that we can just use it for selecting and other than that we've got other ways of changing values than having to do drags. So that's really it. Those are my sort of like tips and suggestions. Um, I do hope that you uh, found this video useful or interesting or enjoyable even. Until the next time, thank you very, very much for watching.